Istanbul was not at all ruling uh, the rest of the Muslim world. Uh, nominally, that was true. But I think nobody knew really what his name was. But, but the fiction was that he represented the continuity between the time of Prophet Muhammad until then. And somehow the question of the caliphate, revolving around the question of who should be caliph, had totally obfuscated the question, the political question in the Islamic world. <clears throat> if you look back at the history of political philosophy in Islam, philosophers have written about the virtues of the caliph. They have followed the path uh, uh, of Greek philosophy, looking at the, way, the best way in which uh, the ruler on this earth would create here, in our world, the kind of order that would reflect best the cosmic order, which is a, a basic uh, a Platonic uh, way of looking at uh, the question of government. And this is the kind of questioning one would have. After 1924, political question was then open. The Turkish assembly sent everywhere in the Muslim world, everywhere meaning mainly al Azhar in Egypt, a message saying now the caliphate doesn't exist anymore. All Muslim societies have the duty <coughs> to just think about the institutions that would best suit them to uh, 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 take care of their uh, worldly affair in this world. And this was a very important step. What it meant, basically, was that uh, the reality of the nation state was then acknowledged. Until then, Dar al-Islam, or the land of Islam, was, uh, <coughs> even if it was a fiction, was the way in which one would refer to uh, a Muslim ummah, community, or even polity. In this case, by sending this message, Basically, the Turkish assembly was telling all Muslim societies, now we have to invent the institutions under which we are going to live. In Turkey itself, as we all know, what was established was the French model of laicity. They did not even bother trying to have a more accommodating form of secularism. You just adopt the French model, which means you never talk about religion take it out of the, the, the public uh, uh, sphere. And uh, that was uh, the, the response to Tur of Turkey to its own question about the institutions that are going now to be um, uh, those of Muslim, of Muslim society. Now, means this idea that secularism in itself was a value a fundamental value to be preserved, Turkey invented a very particular path for uh, um, Islam in general, admired by some, uh, rejected by others. With this role, this particular role devoted to the army, the army was supposed to be the custodian of that secularism, and it was accepted <coughs> that any time uh, uh, things went astray, the army had the, the the mission and indeed the duty to intervene and restore that form of secularism. And this is not just history because uh, Egypt, the, the army in Egypt is tempted by that model of being the custodian of secularism and intervening uh, um, in different ways. And I believe that uh, Jafia would know better, that is still not solved because the, the, the army is going to have a very important role in selecting the people who are going to draft the constitution, even though they are going to elect uh, a constitutive assembly. So <coughs> what did it mean for that uh, uh, event to be the official recognition of the nation state? Until then, you had many political thinkers who just say that the nation state was an idol. And considering the nation state was close to idol worshiping, because you were basically cutting into pieces, into nations, into na nationalism, uh, the Ummah. 
the, the, the fundamental uh, unity of uh, the Muslim uh, uh, community. Now, <coughs> to decide that nation states are okay and people have to organize themselves within nation states would elicit different responses from uh, political Islam. Either you decide to do your best to reconstruct the caliphate. The caliphate has to be recreated, and that is probably the most extreme in uh, political Islam today. I believe uh, I believe in, in uh, Osama bin Laden was some sort of caliph uh, in, in, in many in many respects. You have uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood that was created right after that abolition of the. Caliphate also that followed the years that, that, that followed uh, was a way of uh, uh, all these transnational movements were a way of reconstituting the Ummah and reconstituting some form of, of Caliphate. Uh, Maududi, Hassan al Banna, or Sayyid Khulfu, or uh, Hizb al Tahrir, all these, all these organizations were looking at the way in which this notion of a Caliphate could be reconstructed. Or, you could decide that political Islam is just taking the nation state as it is and Islamizing that nation state, which is somehow, somehow a contradiction in terms in, within political Islam for the reasons that I have uh, indicated. Basically, you are taking the idol of the nation and deciding that you are Islamizing the idol uh, uh, um, itself. But it became more and more uh, the, the the path followed by political Islam. You find all corrupt regimes, and they are all corrupt by very definition of being uh, non Islamic. And then once you have, uh, um, you, you have achieved power, you Islamize the, uh, nation, the nation state. So, somehow, and I submit this to you, you know, the here, somehow this Arab Spring. <coughs> could be seen as a second abolition of the caliphate in that sense, that uh, uh, nation states have made their peace somehow with ideas of democracy, or maybe, maybe they are making their peace with ideas of democracy, of the open society, and maybe also uh, uh, secularism. Which brings me to my second, uh, uh, the second aspect I have I'm considering, which are entitled Towards Muslim uh, Democracy. Uh, I would like to contrast here uh, two recent papers, both published in the French uh, Le Monde, uh, the same day, actually, on November 7. Uh, one is by Jean-Jacques Roche, who is a professor at the University of Panthéon Assas, which is not uh, really uh, a university known to be on the left. <laughs> Things change. Things they do change. They do change. Okay. Okay. <laughs> when I was young, we would not walk next to Assas because we were afraid to be attacked by by some very right wing students from Assas. Well, <laughs> uh, he is a uh, he is a. Professor at Assas, and he's also the director of the Institut Supérieur de l'Armement et de la Défense. And basically, his article is to say uh, we should not have given uh, to this Arab Spring the type of intellectual and material support that we had given to it. Because now we are seeing in Libya, they are calling for Sharia. In Tunisia, uh, Lanoushi has won the, the Nahda has won the, the elections. Uh, in Egypt, it's very likely that the Muslim Brotherhood would have something, well, estimations are around 40%, just like uh, um, in, uh, in, uh, in Tunisia. We should have foreseen this catastrophe is, is, is happening, etc. Uh, we have played the game of fundamentalist uh, uh, movement. So to the question whether political Islam, this article is answering basically, expect the worst. I contrast it with another article published the very same day in also the Monde by Kader Abderrahim, uh, who is a um, researcher in California, 
university and also a researcher in Iris and a very colleague at uh, uh, Sciences Po, who was emphasizing, on the contrary, the fact that uh, uh, um, someone like Anushi in, in, in Tunisia is maybe reinventing a new form of political Islam. And this is something I'm going to say a couple of words on it before uh, uh, Jean-Pierre uh, Filiou give us uh, more or legible uh, statements about that. The general question has been in the last years in all, almost all Muslim countries, should we allow Islamist parties? Let me give you the answer of my own country, Senegal. Um, usually when people think Islam or political Islam, they, they forget the Islam of the Marlins, the African, Sub-Saharan African uh, uh, side of it. But th those are very interesting uh, countries because before the Arab Spring, they have invented uh, democratic and secular uh, uh, Muslim states. <coughs> Senegal did. In Senegal, it is prohibited. You cannot have a political party calling itself Christian Democrat or Islamic this or that or Muslim this or that. Just prohibited. You cannot also, you cannot either have a political party that would call itself from an ethnic group. You cannot have a word of party or a serial party, etc. Algeria and Tunisia had the same thing. And at one point, Algeria, as you know, decided that it was undemocratic to just say that the, an Islamic party cannot, uh, cannot run. And this is why I mentioned the Christian Democrat Party, because of course, you do have Christian Democrat parties in Europe. You cannot have that in uh, Senegal, no. So if you do not allow them, what happens is that uh, uh, people who still identify themselves with those parties. And we have to look at the broader picture and the way in which structural adjustment programs that have been uh, uh, the economic regime in the whole third world for uh, two decades in the 80s and the 90s have just humiliated states everywhere. States found themselves actually uh, uh, useless somehow when it came to protecting people and uh, uh, giving them basic social security. And these parties were able to do that. What they did best was uh, uh, provide the social network and the social security that people were in need of while the state itself, again, had been made totally important by all the uh, uh, structural adjustment policies imposed on many of our countries by the World Bank and, uh, uh, and the IMF. And this is actually somehow what helped these parties, recognized or not, grow deep roots within the society. They had what we say, what we call in French, une fonction tribunicienne. I don't know how to translate that into English. Because there's no protest. I'm looking at Madeleine pretending not to. She would probably know. They would be expressing the protest, but also the fears and the anxieties and the insecurities of, of uh, everybody else. One thing that people forget is that religion always makes it easier for you to bear your own poverty. It is easier to be to live in poverty when you can give some religious significance to your own state and status. So people who live in those countries could see how these political parties, these Islamist movements or parties, have somehow built uh, uh, the, 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 the deep connection that they have uh, uh, with the people. So just posing the question, the general question of recognizing them or not uh, doesn't uh, uh, solve it. So when we ask whether political Islam, it is probably the answer would be what is going to happen with those parties that have the trust of so many uh, in, the, in, the, in, the Muslim, in Muslim societies for many reasons uh, having to do with what I have also to say. If Jean-Jacques Roche is right, 
It means we are in trouble because these parties are very strong and are weak. But we are in trouble maybe for some time, just the time for them to, uh, 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 well, exercise power and see what it means exactly, uh, not, just to, not just to give promises on general uh, terms, but also to deliver on a daily basis <coughs> on uh, economy. Now, the economics of the of their states, or or again, I come back to Turkey here. What happens in Turkey, and what made Turkey such a model today for many in the Muslim world, is going to happen. In other words, Turkey has given uh, um, the example to the Muslim world of a party that seems to be able to deliver development, to deliver modernity, and to deliver some sense of Muslim identity. And the fact that Danushi in Tunisia has referred often to what is happening in Turkey, the fact that he has made public declarations about uh, his acceptance of the family code uh, 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 that Abu Burgiba, secular in the face of the eternal, as we say in French, uh, had uh, invented for, for Tunisia, seems to indicate that he is following that path and inventing a Muslim democracy in the sense of Christian democracies in Europe. When we talk about Christian democratic parties in Europe, now we do not hear any more Christian. Actually, everybody, if we say that the Christian democracy is in uh, well, I believe Angela Merkel is a Christian democrat. So Christian democracy is ruling Germany. Nobody hears uh, Christianity in that. And my bet is that this is probably what is going to happen with political Islam as well. And I consider that that to be a question, general question posed to you. <laughs> Stimulating notion 
of the second abolition of the capital. I think uh, it's really something that opens so many doors uh, for interpretation, so many ways to look uh, <coughs> in a fresh way at a reality that is so diverse, so complex, so lively, that after uh, so many years I wouldn't dare to say for Orientalism on this campus, where uh, some of the most noble fights against Orientalism have been fought and won, but uh, more generally all the cliché, all the stereotypes, and also let's say it, all, uh, uh, all the self uh, justifying discourse that are connected with very hefty agency budgets yeah. that uh, are, have been burgeoning and let's say exploding during the recent years under the security mantra yeah. and the jihadi obsession and the terrorism so I, uh, can very easily you know go to my mea culpa I published uh, three books with Ben Laden on the cover but uh, while we were busy at focusing on uh, uh, the series, the works, the message uh, of uh, basically a cult that is uh, strong of only uh, one had less than 1,000 members uh, during 2011, <coughs> and today it has less than 2,000, which means one after one, one out of one million Muslims. Well, the Muslim world in general, and the Arab world in particular, was moving and moving fast without us uh, probably uh, being aware, not of the, of the movement, we are not that done, but being aware of the extent and the depth of the change. But believe me, we were in good company because the Islamists were in the same situation. They didn't see it coming at all. Nothing. They were totally taken by surprise by what took place. No matter how much now they are pretending to explain that they were at the vanguard. They were not at the vanguard. They were not even sitting on the balcony. They were out somewhere. Because they had grown totally uh, accustomed to the situation that the dictatorship had built. Because in a way, uh, it was of course uh, uh, quite... Uh, tough, you know, demanding situation when you are the focus of state repression. But this state repression, this state emphasis on the Islam is Islam is Islamist, had built them a golden cage, whereas they, they were the good ones because the bad regime were designing them as the bad ones. So, you know, this dialogue, this alternative between the Islamist and the dictatorship was strategically and politically a bounty for them. And um, I truly believe that uh, uh, the, the victory, which we should never forget the relative victory, that 40% of the seats of Fanada, is basically the last gift of an ally to Tunisia. Because, uh, you know, for uh, one generation, Islamists were either underground or exiled. So nobody has a clue in Tunisia of what they really are or mean, and basically they voted for somebody new. And if you take the three first party at this constitutional election, you have the Nahda that was illegal, you have uh, the uh, CPR, Congress for the Republic, the, 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 the Conference for the Republic that was also illegal, and you have uh, Harid Bechardia, the, the popular uh, proposition that uh, did not exist at the time of Ben Ali. So basically, regardless of the issue, because the CPR is basically secular, uh, the issue was, was about changing the guards, changing the faces, having new uh, blood, new um, uh, actors and parties. That is there something sure about the Tunisian revolution is that an had nothing to do with it. You know, when you really push them not too hard, because now you should include this time it's too hard, uh, you never know. Uh, uh, they say we had maybe, maybe, I don't say maybe, one martyr. So I'm not even sure if the guy was really in Ardali or not, you know. Out of 200 plus, so they had nothing. And in Egypt, 
when the 25th, uh, on the 25th of January, that the first day of wage, they were not part of it at all. And it is because of the pressure of the youngest militants that they really got involved two years later with the first day of wage. And when they got involved, they were uh, not particularly happy to listen to slogans like, it's not for Baradai, it's not for the brothers, it's for Egypt. That was what people were chanting in the street of Cairo on the first day of wage. And a little bit later, when uh, Tahrir Square was occupied, and they thought they had it. Uh, finally, uh, uh, because they were invited to negotiate with the regime. That was the dream of their life, believe me. The dream of, of their life was not revolution, was negotiating with Mubarak. And when Mubarak and his deputy, Omar Suleiman, whom everybody forgot since his 30 seconds of fame when he came in front of the camera and said that Mubarak had decided to resign. And then he himself he disappeared. Nobody knows where he is. When you ask about Omar Suleiman, this is a big question mark because nobody cares. And this is the guy that the Muslim Brothers went running for to discuss with uh, on uh, uh, February 6th. Uh, because they were so happy, because this is exactly what they had been waiting for. And what happened is that the very brothers, especially the youngest ones that were on the square, were outraged by uh, the, this opportunism. They were fighting to get rid of the regime, and now they had the historical leadership that was ready to uh, uh, not even bargain, but just discuss, because out of it, you know, they, 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 they have nothing. So uh, there was an accord from the Tahrir Square. Tahrir Square, having become with the previous uh, days uh, a laboratory of uh, integration between the various tendencies of the revolution, with the Muslim Brothers, certainly, but also with secular activists, also with Coptic activists. You have these incredible images of Muslim Brothers. Uh, uh, guarding the mass on the Sunday on Tahrir Square and the other way around on, on Friday with Coptic militants doing it, uh, with feminists, with things like that. And there's something that one should never forget about Tahrir Square is that it was mixed. You had women and men together, even sleeping together in the open air. What can you imagine? Worst from you know uh, 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 an intolerant uh, Islamist point of view. Well, that's where all the young guard of Islamists were for uh, the time of the revolution. So when they learned that the aging leadership was dealing with Mubarak, they were incensed mm -hmm. and they made it known to the so-called leadership. And the uh, leadership, you know, backpedal and say, "Oh, we did that to protect the revolution." Anyway, you know, you've seen that under other skies and with other kind of movement, but they were totally taken back, and certainly they didn't see it through. And what did the Muslim Brothers try consistently after the revolution? Make a deal with the army. Mm -hmm. Look how revolutionary they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Make a deal with the army. And they try once and twice, and you know on which grounds? Mm, you don't like strike, you don't like either. By the way, there is nothing in our program regarding social conflicts, regarding this and that. I don't want to go into detail, but the founding strike of all the Egyptian revolution that took place on 6 of April 2008. That was the first Facebook strike, because you had a, a Facebook group saying general strike, and the whole, I was there in Cairo just by chance, and Cairo went down. You could drive from downtown Cairo to the airport in 10 to 15 minutes. Anybody <laughs> knowing Egypt knows it's pretty exceptional. Huh? And that's something incredible was happening. <coughs> yes, it was a general strike. And I still kept the headline of the Brotherhood newspaper condemning the strike, mm -hmm. saying it's, it's haram. Wow. Th that it was not. You know, if you take the literature of Islamists about social conflict and uh, labor uh, movement, it's pretty conservative, to say the least. 
So everything was put in place for a good old alliance of conservatives between the army and the Islamists to uh, kill uh, the, the burgeoning social conflicts that were taking over all Egypt that are still going on. Personally, I believe the army opposed Mubarak not because of Tahrir, and so all you had uh, all the, the, the cameras of the world on Tahrir, but meanwhile, meanwhile, you know, Alexandria was out in the street, but what is more important, the Suez Canal was a war zone, basically because of the good old proletarians going out in the street and saying, now, nothing in, nothing out. It's a blockade until the revolution is successful, which means the fall of the okay. So this is the position, just to give you an idea of how taken aback they were by the revolution. They, so they didn't see it coming. They are not, they, they, which is, by the way, from their point of view, pretty unfair, because all dictatorship, basically, the, 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 the main uh, uh, sector of repression was Islamist. That the number of people who are in jail, who have been killed, it was basically the Islamists who paid the highest price. But when, when comes the revolution, they were not there. <laughs> or they were there later, they were not there at all. Uh, in and in Egypt, because you know, the good thing with uh, an organization like the Brazil, they, 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 they keep tracks. And uh, so they tell you the number of martyrs uh, in Egypt. And they say, uh, well, I won't go into it, but it's less than one tenth. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. One could say, oh, they are so organized that they escape bullets better than the other unorganized protest. Maybe. But the, the, the main explanation is that they were not at the forefront of the movement. And they were not the one who really you know, went through uh, the revolution. And it was the same in Libya, and it is the same in Yemen, and it is the same in Syria. So before it went, of talking even of the post-revolutionary situation, one has to accept that they are not part, or at least they were not part of the revolution, uh, or not the core part. The, the, the revolution was not Islam. So when I say that to my Russian colleagues and counterparts while uh, visiting Moscow and trying to get a little bit of reason about Syria in Russia, and I was trying to explain them, oh, they, were not, they are not at the core of the revolution. They said, we know that that's not the issue. <laughs> we know perfectly in Russia that they are not the people who are doing the revolution that are reaping the fruits of the revolution. So your, your argument is pointless, because we have quite a record of exactly the contrary. So we are not worried about the revolution. Okay, we accept that the Islamists are not, you know, at the fact what we are interested in is the way that they can you know, manipulate. And in that case, you know, I think we should follow uh, the path of this illuminating thought about the second death of the country. Because this is really at the core. Because if you're talking about political Islam, you have first this tension that is permanent between the post-colonial state uh, and uh, the uh, uh, globalized Ummah, uh, the, 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 the unified community of believers. The reality, uh, I wrote a few things about that, is that even in a group like Al Qaeda, you are basically Egyptian, Libyan, Algerian. That means that all the categories, all the national categories, are pretty valid and became more and more valid. And in a way, the Arab Revolution is a consecration of these post-colonial borders and our state. And you see that through the Islamist movement, it's fascinating, because the Muslim Brotherhood was supposed historically to be an integrated movement with a transnational uh, direction uh, and Islam and Duhalis as an international system or regime <coughs> that nurtured a lot of paranoia and conspiracy theories. But basically, it was like uh, uh, you know, it was an, Egy an Egyptian body, 
that was trying to control more or less the rest of the parties on behalf of the Egyptian center, uh, which was the matrix of, uh, uh, of uh, political Islam in this century, which is the Egyptian Muslim government. So what we see today is that already the different branches of the Muslim Brotherhood have chosen very different paths. It's not new. Uh, it has been you know, uh, uh, going on for, for years. Uh, you, know, you, you have this whole um, uh, process uh, uh, of uh, armed uh, insurgency <coughs> in Syria at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, and you got with the bloodbath in Hama. It was not the mainstream of the local Muslim Brotherhood. It was uh, uh, tendency, uh, you know, the tendency, uh, fighting vanguard and the Kortila, uh, and it was defeated. And this is really you know, uh, when the Muslim Brotherhood, not for matters of ideology, but for matters of uh, suddenly becoming democrat or liberal, decided that the armed struggle is no longer uh, relevant because it, it, it doesn't look <coughs> It's not successful. You know? uh, basically, you know, uh, bodies, uh, even political bodies and Islamist bodies, evolve through experience and experiment. So it has been now a little bit less than three decades that the Brotherhood decided to go for the political way. Uh, so it was before, and in fact, you can track the evolution of Al Qaeda because Bin Laden was initially a Muslim brother who. Uh, went away from uh, the organization because of Syria and then because of Afghanistan. But you have this main matrix that decided to go for the political way, uh, not uh, anymore the, uh, um, uh, the violent one. And with uh, in Egypt, uh, the, the, the different episodes of a very complex uh, relationship with the regime, uh, with the Egyptian regime, like the other regime, playing uh, to the west, uh, the alternative, it's near the Islam. Okay? And, uh, but what is uh, interesting to know is that this idea, it's near the Islamist, uh, was of course uh, the main discourse, uh, justification uh, to America, to the donors in the uh, European Union. But I truly believe that the dictators ended up believing it. Because uh, I had my moments of glory with WikiLeaks. I got to put WikiLeaks. Uh, and in <coughs> WikiLeaks, I said to an American diplomat, and I speak to an American diplomat, uh, we should fear Ben Ali because uh, he's fearing his own people. We, we should be afraid of Ben Ali because he's afraid of the Tunisian people. That's not good. <laughs> he's really afraid. No? And he's afraid, and he was afraid of his own people because he believed Tunisians were Islamists. And he believed that the moment he would open the door, he would get the Islamists uh, next door. No? And so this whole fantasy went on. And uh, of course, you know, with the, 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 the the domestic discourse, which was not it's me or the Islamist, it's me or Iraq, because basically uh, the 2003 invasion of Iraq provided uh, a tremendous bounty towards the dictators, saying, you really want democracy? Mm, look at Iraq, you're welcome, that's really what you want? And of course, it was such a disaster, it was such a ruin, it was such a chaos, that especially in Syria today, the main argument of the dictatorship is Iraq. You know, saying uh, that is what is going to happen if you let me fall. Right? Of course, this is a lie, or this is propaganda, or this is a dirty fantasy and narrative, but still it worked. So, because they were afraid of their own people for being Islamist, what did the dictators do? Well, they provided not political Islam, but conservative Islam to their own uh, country and population. And the whole phenomenon known as Salafism, I don't want to go into the 
definition that Salafism, in its modern, well, in fact, in its very recent acception, because the whole term has a long history, is in fact supposed to be apolitical Islamism. It's supposed to be minasias atarkasias. The best policy, uh, the best politics is not to do politics. And Ali bought that. <laughs> Mubarak bought that. And all those people, while they were saying to the West, oh, we are the only thing standing between you and Islamic reign of terror, were feeding Salafism to their own societies and never asked for it. And they were giving Salafism, uh, they were giving to the Salafis mobs, <coughs> TV station, uh, ministries, and so on and so forth. So one of the problems we see now about the so-called Islamization of the societies have nothing to do with the grassroots phenomenon, but everything to do with the dictators, the very dictators, promoting those uh, uh, Salafi uh, middlemen because they felt uh, uh, at ease, because they were not contesting their power. And sometimes there was a wake-up call. For example, in, in Algeria, suddenly, during the national anthem being played, the Salafis didn't stand up because for them it was haram. And the Algerian officials realized that they had literally you know, uh, uh, grew uh, this phenomenon at the very core. So of course, they fired all the people who had uh, stood for the, for the national anthem. But uh, obviously, they never had asked themselves the question of the political dimension of supposedly a political Islam. Now it's obvious. Salafis are also doing politics. In Egypt, for example, you have three parties for the Salafi movement, which is quite an interesting phenomenon because historically they were not supposed to be. So you have now this re-nationalization of the various branches of the Brotherhood, this Salafism going into politics in ways that are totally unpredictable because it's totally uncharted territory. They have not a clue of what is political Salafism. They don't even know what it is. So they are going because they know that if they don't go now, they will get uh, uh, left out in the cold or in the hot if you're in Alexandria. And so they want to be part of the game. Except being part of the game, uh, is allowing a significant amount of unprecedented uh, competition of the political market. If you are an Islamist, there is one thing you believe deeply, it's Tawhid, it's unity or unification. And so when suddenly in Egypt you have one official party from the Brotherhood, four dissident parties and three Salafi parties, there is a problem. And the problem is so obvious that, for example, Nahda, there is only one party in Tunisia that says they will never collaborate with. It is the other Islamist party. They are ready to work. <coughs> and so, at least we should learn something, you know, in speaking about the, this part of the world. It's plural. Political Islams. Islamisms, because uh, everything is becoming so so diverse, so even contradictory. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, the, the symbolic abolition of the caliphate of those days happened when uh, Prime Minister Erdogan, who is coming from a very radical background in terms of Islamism, mm -hmm. he's not, you know. Nice guy next door. Mm -hmm. He's coming from. He, he has a, quite a record, except he's a politician, mm -hmm. and he wants to stay in power. Mm -hmm. And every election, he won it better than the previous one, which proves that there is something that is appealing to the Turkish people. Two thousand seven, two thousand eleven. Every time more. And so we have this no success story that he can uh, promote in the Arab world. And he went, you know, on a grand trip in Tunisia, Libya, in Egypt. I 
And I think that in Egypt, when he symbolically killed the caliphate for the second time, because he went in a press conference and he went strongly advocating not secularism, that's a nice word for English ears and American audiences. He said la iklik in Turkish, which is laicite in French. You can translate it, we tried. So we exported it because we couldn't translate it. You know? And we made it very clear that it was the way the Turk they took the model, no, but lightly. Yeah? And he said, lightly is good for you. <laughs> and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt just went out of their mind. Because this was exactly what they had been fighting against for the past uh, generation. And so, in 2011, the historical matrix of political Islam, which is the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, when publicly, you know, for the blood <laughs> of the successful model of political Islam, which is Turkey. You know, of course, after that, you still have people talking about uh, Arab Spring and Islamist fall. You know, it's an open, you know, uh, um, field. Uh, the, the revolution is only the beginning, uh, and of course, there will be you know, drawbacks. There will be setbacks, there will be disillusions, there will be uh, defeats, there will be betrayals, but there will be also good surprises. Mm -hmm. And so um, po political Islam is basically engaged now. It has the upper hand today in Tunisia, but its upper hand is uh, full with a lot of responsibilities that are totally new. I mentioned the social dimension, but uh, you have all the other set of issues. One thing that went uh, nearly unnoticed when everybody started to comment uh, the Tunisian election is that most of the female MPs are Islamists. You know, the so called secular progressive leftist party just happened not to have enough women to be elected. No, they were there, but you know, at the bottom of the list, they didn't want the women to, to, to run for, for, for office. Tawakul Karman, who uh, is now the, 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 the Peace uh, Nobel Prize of this year, is a self advocated Islamist and feminist. So that brings us to uh, the, the, the privilege of having to uh, work with notions that are a little bit more complex <coughs> than uh, the polarized world of the dictatorship there or us was before. And in that case, I think it's a fascinating moment we live, full of promises, promises of liberation, promises of emancipation. And I think it is through a process that ideological movements that are deeply ideological and deeply structured from the, the ideology will adjust to a totally different reality, which is the reality of the Arab world after the revolution. Thank you very much. has made quite an effort to position themselves as, as you know, a safe Islamist party, and stressing they won't talk about religion, things like that. So, and I don't mean to be facile, but what, what is Islamist about their platform? And what are they standing for? What distinguishes them as Islamist in terms of their actual policy prescriptions, ideas, so on and so forth, that would distinguish them from the secular left? I mean, if, if that makes sense. You know, that's a, that's a great question. I don't want to, to, to flap it. Because uh, it is true that when you run for election, uh, of course you say, and it was not the case in Tunisia, it was the case in, in Egypt before, and Islam were high in the, in the solution, except in your program, you have very little to see Islam. Basically, what you put forward is being seen, which has kind of moralistic Islamist connection. 
going into corruption and the whole thing. But that's the main issue. And one can say that they were not part of the revolution, but they moved in pretty fast. You know, imagine that they were uh, legalized in Tunisia on March the 1st. And the first branch out of Tunisia open was in Sidi Bouzid, which was uh, when the other parties, leftists, uh, progressive, uh, had not yet bothered to try and go to the symbolic uh, uh, cradle of the revolution, while they did it, and Hanushi went over, and all this. I like the plural of plural. So personally, I think the you, you, there is always a tension with Islamism, which could be compared from the political science point of view with the tension. I'm talking about the organization with communism, because there is the party, and the party has to be protected at all costs. And Nahda has quite a lot of arguments to push forward, because thanks to this discipline, very strong discipline, they could survive, and survive uh, a terrible oppression. Uh, it was not as bloody as Egypt, certainly not as Syria, but that a lot of people uh, definitely who not only got imprisoned, but got uh, tortured to death. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they have this, uh, this, but this is basically what, what they put uh, forward. But, and this brings us again back to the abolition. When uh, the French press, sometimes the French press can be quite, uh, I would say, sensitive you know, to the you know, to, uh, Islamists. They started to say, oh, look how Islamist is Ramushi. He said, you should speak pure Arabic. I, I, I must have missed something. <laughs> what is it? What? Because basically, he was saying that he wanted, in fact, not the classical, but the modern Arabic to be spoken. And in that case, he was basically nationalist. He was trying to express something that is very dear to most of the Tunisians, mm -hmm. that we want to be uh, heard and understood by all the other Arabs in the Arabic, all the other Arabs can understand. This had nothing to do with Islam or Islamism. It had nothing to do with any anger against French or I don't know what. Right? Because the other argument was to say, aha, look, Radushi was exiled. Huh, guess where? In England. Ha ha ha. And then you're supposed to have said anything about how anti French, how anti secular is a guy. You know, I can buy this kind of argument, you know. I'm probably very slow, very old, but I don't see the connection, you know. But people say that, and they say, hmm, you see, and it's supposed to be off. Except, you know, what he put forward during the campaign, and again, you know, it has to be tested with reality, and the feminists are sure to be very aware and on the alert in Tunisia, because they want nothing about uh, the hard, uh, hard game. Uh, uh, progress. They, they want nothing to be touched, and they are even more ambitious. They want the liberation of the woman to move forward. And one thing about uh, the Sharia, because the whole Sharia thing. So, everybody, you know, when you say Sharia, everybody, uh, you know, in Tunisia, in Bourguiba, in Ben Ali's Sharia is the main source of the family code until today. Until today, in Tunisia, a Muslim woman cannot marry a non-Muslim man. Until today, in Tunisia, <coughs> uh, a, a, a daughter is inheriting half of the, the son. So the whole, you know, issue. Of course, we have the personal code and all this. That was very, uh, that was a tremendous step forward at the time of Bourguiba, and Ramushi made it very clear that he's not going to. But the issue today of, you know, the inheritance and all this, it's an issue that was never tackled neither by Bourguiba nor Ben Ali. And I would be very happy if there is a progress or even a law today under uh, the, the new authorities. 
but it is totally uh, 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 wrong by any standard to, to blame it on, his, on the Islamists or on the Sharia because it was there uh, during the previous phase and under, you know, uh, secular devant l'éternel mm -hmm. as a prohibit. Uh, so so mm -hmm. it's uh, the same way in Egypt, the Article 2 about Islam and the state was enforced by Sadat in 1970. And when there was the debate after the revolution to change it, the first one to say, you're not going to change it was Sheikh al Azhar, you know, a civil servant that had been appointed by Mubarak. It was not the Islamics. So this whole debate is so, you know, uh, full of stereotypes, cliché, that the real fault lines are very often forgotten. And uh, I agree with you in the fact that most of the success of an Ahda is not religious-based. It's much more complex. Right? Identity road, nationalism, <coughs> uh, uh, clean slate, uh, and the fact sorry to go back to that, that nobody knows them. So if nobody knows them, they're probably better than the rest, which, from a historical point of view, is always a dangerous assumption, or a risky one. Right. Yeah, um, what, what have been in the past, in the recent past, links and relationships, you know, on the one hand, this kind of you know, Islamist parties of the Middle East, Egypt, Tunisia, and so on. And between, on the other hand, the extreme militant, uh, uh, militant movements like the Taliban and Al Qaeda centered around Afghanistan and Pakistan. I mean, what are the, how have those links been evolving? And do you see a danger or risk or possibility of those links getting kind of strengthened in some way or the other? You know, uh, which is why I mentioned the 1982 uh, turning point with the Hamas bloodbath in Syria, which is something that is totally crucial to understand the Syrian revolution right now, which is why the Syrian revolution is consistently not violent, because they know that Bashar al-Assad wants them to use the weapon to you know, uh, try and, and go through the same process. So it's uh, crucial. So personally, I try to make the distinction between Islamism and jihadism. I don't believe uh, it's never that clear. Well, it is that clear. But of course, you can say, oh, Ben Laden was a former Muslim brother. And a lot of people, you know, Gamal and Ben Nasser was a former Muslim brother. Yasser Arafat. Oh no, he's not supposed to have been a uh, Muslim brother, you know, because he has good, he has good press attaché even after his death. Anyway, a lot of people are coming from uh, the Muslim brother. But the issue he, is quite clear cut. And the issue revolves about the central figure of Sayyid Qutb. And if you say Sayyid Qutb is not a Muslim brother, you're totally uh, out of history. You have this uh, seminal book by uh, Gilles Kepel. Uh, about the uh, uh, prophet and the pharaoh, about Sayyid Qutb, and Sayyid Qutb was at the center of the Brazilian uh, uh, violent uh, evolution in the 60s against Nasser. It's a whole period that ended with the bloodbath in Syria. So now the Qutbian, I mean the violent one, uh, you still have philosophical or political Qutbian in Brazilian in Egypt, including the actual uh, leader of them, the self-professed Qutbian, but not with the, uh, it's taking the political Qutbian, the, the military Qutbian are with, uh, are with uh, the jihadists, and Zawahiri, who is now the leader of Al-Qaeda, is somebody who wrote in 92 a volume to really condemn anything the Muslim Brothers stand for. It's called the bitter harvest. Mm -hmm. and, it, uh, and it was really uh, step by step, you know, saying the Muslim Brothers 
are against, you know, uh, for, 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 for two main reasons. First, they accept the political game, which means that they uh, foreclose uh, the jihad path, while uh, Al Qaeda and the Wairi and all this consider jihad as not only a means but a hand. And Laden one then say, who is a Muslim, he says somebody who is waging jihad, which is not just, you know, in one sentence, excluding, yeah, because for him it's military jihad, it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient. So in one sentence, he was excluding 99% of the Muslim from, from the Jews, because he knew, he knew, he had no Ramon, he knew. You know, he was supposed to be the only uh, Muslim who knew. So, um, uh, so you you have this tension, and today it's quite it's quite clear, you know. And uh, again, now the main tension inside political Islam is with you know, the Muslim Brotherhood is very branchy. The Turkish or Turkey side, I don't know what. Would like to emulate the Turkish model, maybe not so much in ideology, but in economic growth. Mm -hmm. Basically, that the thing that is very dear to the heart of all the big fans of the Turkish model, it's you know the growth, the prosperity. You know, uh, the the, the uh, AKP, which stands for uh, Party of Justice and Development, was historically called Arifa, uh, prosperity. It's not you know. Like that's a, that's a very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, connection. And then you have the Salafis, who are now back into, they are not back, they were never supposed to be into politics, and nobody knows where they will stand. They will stand with the social order, with the, but definitely all those, so already you see, you have quite a diverse body. But they stand, uh, all of them, in the political realm. Uh, and, uh, and they all have uh, a vested interest in uh, disarming the, 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 the violent tendency. Personally, uh, I did a talk in Arabic in June 2010 at the Ahram uh, Center for, uh, for Political Studies in downtown Cairo. I wanted to call it the end of jihad. <coughs> My Egyptian friends say, <laughs> maybe it's not appropriate. So they call it, what happens after political radicalism? I love it. My bad radicalism. Because everybody understood. And in fact, half of the audience were former jihadists. And when I started to do, in fact, my end of jihad uh, piece, of course, you had the uh, usual anti-imperialist who stood, how can you speak, you French, about this and that? And then the former jihadist stood up and said, what's good? Share, you know? <laughs> in, that's exactly what we feel. You know, that this whole process of, you know, jihadism is over. And for example, you had all this talk about uh, Ben Hajj, the military governor of Cuba. By the way, he's military governor of I don't know how many neighborhoods, because the other neighborhoods are controlled by Misrata, and the other neighborhoods by. But, but you say, oh, the jihad is military governor. <laughs> well, <laughs> I happen to have read his literature. And there is something called El Moraja which is a self-criticism, which is the most elaborate treatise of anti-jihadism. <laughs> so I don't say the guy is cool. I don't say the guy is a Democrat. But he's certainly not a jihadist. He has an agenda, uh, an open agenda, an hidden agenda, name it whatever. But it's not a jihad agenda. Because basically, he wants the most significant part of our share of power in Libya. And the very idea, again, coming back to the abolition of the country, they don't have an Egyptian agenda. Or you know, if you're a jihadi, borders, 
are the creation of colonialism, state and idols. And you see all these people totally into the framework. And in Egypt, after the revolution, one of the most bloody uh, jihadi group decided to go political, the Gamma, the ones that were behind some of the worst massacres of recent uh, history in Egypt. And they said, no, no, we're going to form. We drop the weapons, it's over. So one could say, oh, it's terrible. But you know, at, at the same time, uh, this is the way, this is historical trend. Uh, because uh, uh, those revolutions prove that non violence can reap far more benefits than the violent one. And this is worth more than any uh, discourse or pledge or allegiance to the democratic values. Because basically, non violence works. So that's quite a change. I know one of the things that you are saying features that uh, the Turkish model of political Islam are, are, are offering the uh, Islamic world. The salient features as to what the Turkish model, why do we want to emulate the Turkish model? Yeah, I told you, basically economic growth. I mean, there's nothing specific related to the, um, to the Quran or any particular principle? You know, you can say anything about the Arab Islamists, but they don't speak Turkish. <laughs> so they have absolutely no clue, <laughs> I'm sorry to be that gruff, of what really, from the ideological point of view, the Turkish model means, because basically the Turkish Islamists write in Turkish to Turkish Islamists. So maybe they have a few booklets in Arabic that are basically, you know, the outreach so the <laughs> of the Turkish party to say, look how cool our... But there is something, you know, uh, uh, apart from, uh, from the ideology. So it's not the issue of ideology. It's basically the issue of power and how do you exert power. Because what does Erdogan say? He says this, we have been jailed, humiliated, imprisoned. We accepted the rule of the game. We accepted the army. Now, after 10 years, I got rid of the army. Yeah. This is quite a clear message that is pretty, you know. But the other thing that makes the Turkish message very strong is Palestine. And as Hassan Salame, uh, who was uh, for many years here, professor at SIPA, is now cherishing every day our dean at the Paris School of International Affairs, he said Palestine is the highway to the heart of the Arab. And Erdogan took the highway once, twice, three times. And so this is incredible. Today, the most popular figure in the Arab world is Erdogan, because of Palestine. Not because of Islam or ideology or AKP, not even because of the economic growth. But it is somebody, not somebody who is fighting Israel, but somebody who is standing to Shimon Peres at the Devil's Forum and saying what you say is outrageous, and standing up and leaving the room. So, now, maybe it's symbolic violence, but it's pretty respectful. So you're not into full-fledged, you know, call for arms. But this message came to the I would say, Hassan Salah, to the heart of the Arab, because for the past decade, no Arab leader had the guts to stand up and say, what you, my friend, friend, are saying is outrageous, and I'm leaving, on the contrary. Yeah. So uh, this is what makes it uh, basically possible. And in that case, again, we're going back to the abolition of the country. Because one could say, and even the Turks <coughs> are saying that, they say we are into neo-Ottomanism, except they were saying that to the Americans and to the Europeans. Now that there is a revolution in the Arab world, there's no more neo-Ottomanism, <laughs> because they know that if they say that to the Arabs, the backlash will be terrible. The Ottomans are back. Well, where is the gun? Because, you know, the whole issue of the abolition of the caliphate was a process that was laid back an Arab revolution that was waged in 1960 
by uh, the governor of Mecca, Sheikh Hussein, who was a descendant of the Prophet, against the illegitimate caliphate of, uh, of uh, uh, Istanbul, because no Turk had the right to proclaim himself a caliph. And when, after the end of the war, after this, after that, the caliphate was ultimately abolished by the Turks, immediately the same Sheikh Hussein proclaimed his caliphate in Mecca. From the ideological point of view, he had it all. You know, he was a descendant of the Prophet, he was in Mecca, he was an Arab, you know, and who destroyed him? The Wahhabi, the Saudi. So mm -hmm. the, the, the founding act of the Wahhabi nation state is the destruction of the last Arab caliphate. Quite something. And when you know the connection between political Islam today and Saudi Arabia, the, uh, the various networks, ideological networks, political networks, financial networks, then the fact that at the heart of all this, you have Wahhabi militants moving in uh, Mecca and destroying the last Arab caliphate of history, well, that's, uh, that's quite something. And uh, today, the, the Turks, basically, they would like, how could I put it, to have a, a significant soft power. Uh, yes, I think soft power is a notion that would be more appropriate. That could be, and of course, we will focus on the religious dimension, but the main dimension would be economical, cultural, and the fact that they are trying to sell their, their know-how. Now, any, any revolutionary militant has been invited once or twice by the Turkish embassy you know, uh, to free to, to Turkey. Because they don't know Turkey. They know only Davos and those kind of speeches. You know. So they are building this slowly, slowly, but with all the resolve of the Turkish state. It's quite a state. So am I correct in saying that the situation is always going to be volatile there because there's no ideological traction? For you, for a situation not to be volatile, you need the ideology? No, you don't have an ideological traction there, so is that why the situation will always be volatile when it is? But you think with ideolo ideological traction there is stability? Well, it depends on what the ideology is. Yeah, but... Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm asking the question because yes, for it you... Yes, will, it will definitely, depending you, you on the ideology. You think ideology means stability? Because no, I, I say I'm so frantically anti-ideology that I have a lot of uh, trouble admitting that ideology means stability. Ideology means a lot of, uh, I think, uh, curses when it's applied to reality that is stupid enough not to accept the ideology and therefore you have depression, invasion, you have the neocon tell you Arabs only like force, so you need to topple the leader and like that, and then democracy will bloom. Uh, I don't think ideology means stability, uh, but maybe in that way you, you could have a, um, I don't even see there is attraction. You know, uh, I see a very complex set of uh, uh, power relations involving soft power much more than hard power, because basically it's about the the, the, the will of the people. And uh, nobody knows the, what the people want until you ask them. And now we're only starting asking the Arab people what they want. And it will take a while before getting a clear picture, not because of volatility, but because we're talking about life. So life is not a pre planned concept. That doesn't mean that if you take Tunisia, the level of violence in the revolution is historically low. You know, and this is the French Turkey. And usually after a revolution, it's not very violent. Look at uh, Tunisia since the revolution. The level of self-discipline, the level of uh, tolerance, the level of so you might call it volatile. Personally, I find it pretty stable. But maybe it's a, it's a problem of, uh, of uh, definition. Yeah. Maybe you're saying that uh, um, the health gates, I wonder how you, uh, how you situate Shia 
sealing up the main challenge, the most daunting challenge, is how to address this, I wouldn't say tension, but this dialogue between the national identity and uh, the, 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 the confession, the confessional religious sectarian uh, uh, polarization. And so they have to build, and so far they have been quite good at it, uh, a model that is both inclusive and positive. But um, I'm sorry I cannot be more specific. Maybe we'll give him a chance to do it. I was going to ask, do you think with the onset of these revolutions, we're going to see a trend? We, we've already seen it in some other places as well, where religion is subordinated to the nation state and subordinated to national interests. Where religion is defined necessarily as a national consolidator and something that's it's really defined in terms of the interests of the, of the nation itself. Is that, is that the Turkish model? I mean, exactly. In the Turkish model, you have a case where the state controls religion, even though it claims to be secular. No. But the whole thing is that we have to totally uh, uh, upgrade all our uh, machinery of concepts, uh, including secularism and laicity, because basically, secularism was a curse word to good Islam, quote unquote, moderate Islam, that like you know now we're looking for moderate Taliban. I know Taliban, Taliban. You know, I don't know moderate Taliban. But you need to call them moderate, which means basically that they are compatible with your agenda at this very moment. And that can be quite uh, evolving. So the whole issue of secularism has nothing to do with secularism per se. That means separation of religious and political sphere. But everything with the supposedly moderate uh, Islam that you are promoting. And if you are promoting a model, then you are suddenly a, a secular leader. But of course, now it's all, all this you, you can forget. And it's true that the Turkish model, uh, yeah, the model, it is the Turkish system, is a system of state control over what is the orthodoxy of Islam. Much stronger control than anything that exists. So we'll see. Personally, I don't see uh, this tendency right now, but maybe it will develop. And this is certainly when people are fans of Turkey, it's certainly not that dimension that they want. They don't realize that in Turkey, you have that you know, uh, control. And in Turkey, if you are Alevi and you are not Sunni, you, are, you just don't think don't exist from, from the state Islam point of view. If you're Hanafi. If you're not Hanafi. Yes, uh, I say Sunni because uh, Hanafi, uh, they call, I should have said Hanafi, of course. But uh, Hanafi compared to Alevi, uh, like Sunni compared to Hanafi. So if, uh, you're, you're just out, which means that 25% of the Turkish Muslims are not taken into consideration by the uh, state Islam. Quite a Thank you very much, Austin.